Which brings us to a section of Philippians where Paul is discussing how he evaluated his life. And he talks about things that he gave up, things that he surrendered, things that he counted as lost, even some of those very good things. But he said those things are minimalized when one compares them to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. And so he has a number of things that he desires to win. He wants to know Christ. He wants also to know the power of his resurrection. He wants to also experience the fellowship of his suffering. And those are all lessons that we've looked at in the past, which brings us to the end of verse 10 and also then verse 11, where he says that I want to be conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. I want to begin our study of that section of this text by reviewing multiple translations and how they render this verse. Because obviously, there's some things in there that may strike us a little confusing. The NIV says, I want to become like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. The New Living says, sharing in his death so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. The New American Standard says, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. The King James Version, being made conformable unto his death if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And the English Standard Version says, Becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. The New Century Version says, Becoming like him in his death, then I have hope that I myself will be raised from the dead. Obviously, there's some differences in the translators and their understanding of the verse. So I've left a little spot in the bulletin there and I ask you to, uh, to evaluate what are your first impressions of the meaning of that section of Philippians chapter 3. When you read that, what, what is entering your mind? What is your first impressions? And if you want to jot down some things, feel free to do that. Just give you a minute to process that. As I read that text and looked at that, it appeared to me that there were three things that uh, the text talks about. One is that Paul wants to be like Jesus in his death. That's pretty much what he says. I want to uh, be conformed to his death. Also that there is this, uh, this part of this verse that says, assuming that I may somehow. That seems to be another phrase that strikes me. Paul is, is saying... Uh, if perhaps, I think some translations, it's just rendered differently, but there seems to be uh, this assuming that this might happen for me. And then thirdly, that uh, he wants to experience resurrection from the dead. That's what Paul's desire is. So I broke down, let's look at each of those uh, and what perhaps Paul might be implying. When Paul says that he wants to be like Jesus in death, what is he saying? Is it his desire to be unjustly accused? Is it his desire to receive a mock trial, to be beaten? Does he want to wear a crown of thorns and a robe? Does he desire crucifixion? Is that what Paul means when he says, I want to be like Jesus in death? I think as we seek to answer that, we need to understand, first of all, that this phrase is related to the last phrase, which was that Paul wanted to share a fellowship in his sufferings. So it grows out of that understanding. Paul says, I want to share in his sufferings, and I want to experience, I want to experience death as Jesus did. So it becomes an illustration of the depth of what Paul desires to share with Christ how deeply he wants to experience the sufferings of Jesus. He is, if you will, committed to die like Jesus died. And I think that uh, when we think of that, uh, that maybe there's another dimension to look at uh, 
uh, relative to the commitment that that says rather than to the physical death that we may tend to attach to that. That Paul says, I want to die like Jesus died. I want to be committed like Jesus was committed. I, I want to experience the same thing, the same kinds of suffering Jesus had because I am so committed to the task that is before me. Being like Jesus and his death may refer to a bigger picture than just his physical death. What, what, what I found interesting from my own meditations on, on this passage was the fact that death in the Greek language just means a separation. That's all the word means. Now, specifically, it gets applied in Scripture. This separation gets applied in Scripture a couple of different ways. One of which is the separation of body and soul. And we find that that's talked about in Scripture as the physical death. But there is also in Scripture, it, it uses this word to describe a separation between God and humanity. And so that would be a spiritual death. So the word itself means a separation. It could be physical, it could be spiritual. Vine, after making the comment about physical and spiritual death, says this, Death, in whatever of the above-mentioned senses it is used, is always in Scripture viewed as the penal consequence of sin. And since sinners alone are subject to death, Romans 5.12, it, it was as the bearer of sin that Lord Jesus submitted therefore on the cross. 1 Peter chapter 2, he took our sins on that tree. And while the physical death of the Lord Jesus was the essence of his sacrifice, it was not the whole. So when we think about the death of Jesus, the separation that Jesus was willing to endure, physical death indeed is part of that sacrifice, but that's not the whole of it. It's not the complete picture of it. So that then led me to process, well, Paul says he wants to share in the death of Jesus. Is he just talking about the physical death, or is there a bigger dimension that he may be referencing? Is Paul talking about something that may be grander than just limiting to physical death? There is a dimension of Jesus' death that is recognized within his decisive devotion and complete commitment. So Paul may be saying, I want to die like Jesus died. I want to have the level of commitment that Christ demonstrated. Now you'll remember earlier in Philippians, back in chapter 2, Paul has outlined pretty specifically how Jesus separated himself in this process. The, the death that Jesus endured that was bigger than just physical death. We read this, Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not e consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself. Do you see that as death? You see that as part of the death process that Jesus was willing to endure, separating himself from his deity. He emptied himself of being deity, and he assumed the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of, a ma of men, and, when he, and then he came as a man uh, in his external form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The word that is used here for emptied means to make empty. Figuratively, it is applied to making yourself a base, to neutralize yourself or to falsify. So what Jesus did in coming to earth is he neutralized himself. He no longer is God as he was. He emptied himself. He, will, he did, in a sense, engage in a separation, a death, if you will. Paul may be inferring that he wishes to be so intent on gaining Christ that he will die, completely empty himself to the world of his current existence. I want to die like Jesus died. And part of Jesus' death was this separation from his deity, and I want to be that separated from my humanity. Thus, we can take on the spiritual. Thus, he can take on the spiritual nature of Jesus, and look forward to a new existence. You just stop and think of it. This, this is this is a tremendous thought that Paul that Paul shares because 
He's actually talking that he wants to do the opposite of Jesus. Now, he wants to do that because he wants to die like Jesus died, but it ends up being the exact opposite. Jesus emptied himself of his deity to become humanity. Paul says, I want to empty myself of my humanity so that I can gain every spiritual benefit. Jesus became a slave to humanity by becoming man. Paul wants to be a slave to Jesus. That's how he begins the book. Paul and Timothy, slaves of Christ Jesus our Lord. He also wants to take on the form of Jesus in this life. What did Jesus do? Emptied himself, took on the form of humanity. What does Paul want to do? I want to so die with Jesus that my humanity takes on the form of Jesus right here on earth. And then that will result in being resurrected to a new life. To a new life. <clears throat> Such a conclusion is in keeping with what Paul has indicated in other passages about his level of devotion. He often has used the term death to refer to putting Christ above other things. Galatians chapter 2, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Referencing death, a separation from myself, from my ego, so that Christ can live in me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, for as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? Look at what he says in verse 31, I die every day. I die every day. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then he talks about if I fought the wild beast in Ephesus for just human reasons, then there's, there's no gain in that. If the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. Paul says, I die daily. This death is something that's going on all the time in me. Or Colossians chapter 3, Let your minds, uh, set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with the Messiah. What's happened to those who follow Jesus? We've died. We've experienced death. So Paul uses the term often. Romans chapter 6, Therefore we're buried with him by baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too we too might walk in newness of life. If we've been joined with him in the likeness of his death, we certainly will also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Again, the reference of death, separation. Paul clearly teaches that Jesus' followers are those who have conformed to his death. Jesus also used similar language when he said, if you want to save your life, you're going to have to lose it. And, uh, and if, if you gain the whole world, but you forfeit your life, what value is it? Jesus was saying the same thing. We've got to die to self and live for him. Conforming to the death of Christ can refer to the manner in which believers separate themselves from things carnal and devote themselves to things eternal. So Paul may just be meaning in that phrase, that he wants to die like Jesus died. I want to view the world with the same intensity that Christ did. I want to be dead to this person of sin. I want to live differently. And the second phrase that I think we need to look at in this text is thus assuming that I may somehow, and that's from the Holman Standard Christian Bible. Um, it's kind of a curious statement, which initially may appear to have Paul uncertain about the benefits of knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. We may look at that and say, well, Paul, are you saying might not be? I might not have this? To view this statement as embodying any doubt regarding God's ability to save through the blood of Jesus does not fit with Pauline teaching. He has on numerous occasions let us know that there is certainly a resurrection. And so, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. Paul is making the point in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Hey, there's a resurrection. Some are saying it hasn't happened. It is going to happen. And he goes to great lengths to describe that in chapter 15. Other passages, Romans chapter 6 and verse 5, where he says, Certainly we shall in the light be 
in the likeness of his resurrection. Certainly. Interesting term in the original language. It's a future tense of I exist. Certainly we shall be. In the future, I will exist. Certainly. Uh, there's no doubt what Paul is meaning there. Or in 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul references there that the Lord knows those who are his. He knows those who are his. Most scholars attribute any tone that we might get from this text as being uncertain. That has nothing to do with God, but rather that it has to do with Paul expressing his own question of whether or not he can stay committed to that moment. If he can maintain that strong desire to die with Christ. This is suppo supported by the idea that when he uses the word that he might attain or reach, depending upon your translation, that, uh, that Greek carries in, the, uh, carries in it the idea of reaching the end of a pilgrimage or a journey. So what Paul is saying is, if perhaps I might attain, if I stay faithful till the end, then this is going to be what I receive. Paul is saying that if he continues in his devotion to Christ above all else, he will at the end of his earthly pilgrimage be resurrected. And that brings us to our last observation. Paul will experience the resurrection from the dead. First of all, what is fascinating about the term Paul uses here is this is the only place in the New Testament where this word appears. The resurrection uh, is usually uh, a stasian, as you see it there. But in this passage, it has a prefix attached to it, the Greek prefix ek, which is the preposition for out. So literally, this passage says, if somehow I attain to the out resurrection from the dead ones. Literally, that's what the passage says. If I attain to the out-resurrection of the dead ones. Um, a couple of possibilities <laughs> that may exist as to what that means. Paul may be expressing his hope that he will fully realize what it means in this life to experience what he has just stated. Namely, the resurrected life of Christ being lived out fully within him. In other words, he may be saying, because he's already said he wants to know the power of the resurrection of Christ, and we studied what that meant and, and what that means for us. But he may be saying that out of everyone, I, I want to live out the power of the resurrection of Jesus. I want to live out of the resurrected ones this power of Christ. I want to do this with such diligence that it, it, will, it will set me up as one who is going to get to the end of my pilgrimage, my journey, and I will have lived it out. This would give plausibility to the thought of believers right now living resurrected lives. And all we're waiting for is the glorification that may be interesting to discuss tonight. Are we living resurrected lives right now? That's a possibility of what Paul means. I want to live this out right now. The full experience of the power of the resurrection of Jesus. The other suggested understanding is that Paul may be referencing the future resurrection of the faithful whose bodies will be resurrected, but when Jesus returns, their new existence will come, if you will, out of that resurrection. That there will be a new body that somehow resembles the old, but it will be new. That it will come out. It will be an out-resurrection. And that may be as well what he is referencing. We recognize from what Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that that's our desire as children of God. We are God's children and if children also heirs and heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, seeing that we suffer with him, similar language to Philippians, so that we may also 
be glorified with him. Really, whichever view that you may choose to hold, one of those, one of your own, it really is of little significance because the contextual point that Paul is sharing is that in Jesus, Paul has relationship. He wants to know Christ. That he wants to know the power of his, he wants to know the regeneration that happens in this life because of what Jesus did, because of the fact that he was resurrected. He wants to have that regeneration. He is willing to suffer the rancor, all of the, the, the painful situations that Jesus endured so that he can achieve those things. He wants to know Christ. He wants to be regenerated by Christ. He wants to suffer it, uh, the, the rancor with Christ. And when he does that, he will be rewarded by Christ. And so whether he is referencing a powerful way of living now or a, a new way of living in the future, it really does not matter. It's a reward that comes by devotion. Paul longs to gain a connection with the person of Christ, to bond with the power of Christ, to share in the passion of Christ, and to achieve the praise of Christ. And herein I found my anchor point, my anchor place, because who can doubt that such was also the desire of Brother Maurice? That he longed for those things. He longed for those things. All of that is attainable by counting everything else as loss, are you like Paul longing to gain Christ above all else? Folks, that's got to happen. That's the beginning point. I thought about the, as Hayden was reading our scripture reading. There's a part of that text, I think it's verse 58, that says, be unmovable. And I thought as he read that, I thought back when we studied that passage at school. I think it was, I think it was Norman Gibson was substituting and, and he was leading our class that day said something to the effect, that's one section of scripture that there's a whole bunch of brethren love to obey, to be unmovable. When it comes to longing to gain Christ above everything else, folks, there's no room for being unmovable. We can't make Jesus second, third, fourth. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And all this gets added to you. So do we, like Paul, long to gain Christ above everything else? If not, then what stands in the way? We can become imitators of Paul's longing today. We can long to receive the praise of Jesus by dying like Jesus died, by staying faithful till the end, and by experiencing the benefits of our resurrected life right now and looking forward to what that promise is in the future. Father, help us this day as we think about the challenges that the Apostle Paul gives us in this message. He um, is in a situation where he personally is in peril. He's enduring, there's conflict, there's uncertainty, and he's able to come to the anchor point of his life. But he wants to know Jesus above everything else. He wants to experience the power of the resurrection that he offers. That he longs, Father, and he's willing to suffer because Jesus suffered. And, Father, that he wants to die like Jesus died so that he can be resurrected. Help us to seek the person of Christ to allow him, Father, to save us, to direct us, to give us purpose, help us to count everything but loss so that we can gain him. Father, anything that stands in any of our ways this day that keeps him from being the main thing, may we get rid of it. May we set it aside. May we recognize the futility of it. May we see, Father, the glory of counting Jesus as everything. Forgive us when we let ourselves get in the way, other things stand in the way. Help us, Father, to humble ourselves 
so that we can be like the master who humbled himself. It's in his name that we make this request. Amen.